Today, I'm going to be sharing with you a sneak preview of my new course on the simple algorithm. I'm really excited to be bringing you this sneak preview because I'm going to be showing you the style of teaching that I've adopted in this course. What you'll find in this sneak preview and you'll also find in the course is that the style of teaching I'm using is similar to the type of teaching that you may be used to from school or universities where I use a whiteboard to explain, go through the course material. But what makes this style of teaching different and what I'm trying to do here is that the lectures are condensed into 15 or 20 minutes, so really short and compact and only showing you the essential information that you need to know about the simple algorithm and cutting out all of the other material that you don't really need to know. And alongside the short, concise lectures, what I'm going to be doing is providing you with lecture notes to go along with the lectures as you go along. But rather than giving you these as PowerPoint handouts, the lecture notes are actually going to be interactive. And what I mean by that is that the lecture notes are partially filled out. So most of the information for the lectures is contained in the notes. And so you don't need to be furiously writing down the course material as you go through the lectures. But there are some interactive answer boxes and true false questions as you go through the lecture. So it's going to keep you hooked and engaged with the material as you go through the lecture. And then by the time you're finished with the lecture, you'll have a complete set of notes that contains all the information that you need for the lectures. And that's the approach that I've used throughout the entire course. And I really wanted to give you a go today at trying out this style of lectures uh, that I'm presenting in the course to see if you like it before you get involved with the full course. So before I show you the sneak preview from this lecture, I've left a link in the description below for the interactive lecture notes. And you could just download those as a PDF and then either print them off or have them alongside you while you're watching the lecture. And you can fill in your answers as you go along, which will really help you uh, to be engaged. So definitely download those lecture slides and get ready to jump into the lecture. Now, the lecture preview that I'm gonna give you here today uh, as a preview of the course is lecture two from the simple algorithm, where what I do is develop the simple algorithm itself from first principles in a conceptual manner without introducing any of the main equations that the actual simple algorithm uses. So I'm hoping that you'll see by going through this lecture that you can start to develop an understanding of the simple algorithm first, and then later in the course on the simple algorithm, when you've understood really what's going on, I then introduce all of the equations for you and you can fill in all of the knowledge so that by the end of the course, you have a really strong understanding of how the simple algorithm works. So download those lecture slides and let's jump into the sneak preview from lecture two from my course on the simple algorithm. Welcome to the second lecture in this course on the simple algorithm. In this lecture, what I'm going to be doing is explaining to you the conceptual idea that underlies the simple algorithm. By the end of this lecture, you're actually going to have a really good idea of how the simple algorithm works in principle without going into any of the details of the equations. What I'm then going to be doing later in this course is actually looking at the equations in detail and deriving them so that you actually have that detailed understanding of the simple algorithm as well as the conceptual understanding which I'm going to go through in this lecture. And what I'm going to be doing to develop this conceptual understanding of how the simple algorithm works is actually to use a very simple example problem which you may have come across before. And the example problem I'm going to be using is the fully developed flow between two parallel sided plates. And what this looks like is if we have two parallel sided plates like this, and these plates are both walls, so there's no flow passing through the wall. Far from the entrance region of this flow, when the flow is fully developed and the boundary layers are fully developed to cover the width of the profile, what we find is that we get a fully developed velocity profile that for laminar flow is parabolic and looks something like this. So the velocity is moving faster at the center of the channel, slower at the sides of the channel and is equal to zero at the wall. And the coordinate system we're going to be using is Y is the vertical direction, X is the horizontal direction 
and this channel has a height h, which you can see there. And you can solve this problem by hand, and I've actually got the full worked solution in the course textbook, so if you want to see the full solution, you can find it there. But what does the solution look like? The solution tells us the shape of this velocity profile, u, the axial velocity component, as a function of the vertical height y. And what does it look like? Well, the axial velocity component u is equal to minus 1 over 2 times the dynamic viscosity mu times by the pressure gradient in the x direction multiplied by yh minus y squared. So that's the, that's the solution of this problem. If we solve the continuity in Navier-Stokes equations by hand, that's the formula that we get for the velocity profile. And I'm going to be using this formula to help explain the simple algorithm and how it works in principle if we want to develop a numerical solution of the continuity in Navier-Stokes equations. But before we do that, what does this equation actually tell us? The first thing it does is it says that the velocity component is proportional to minus the pressure gradient in the x direction. And this can be confusing at first. The minus sign does not mean that the velocity is negative. We need the minus sign because the pressure gradient reduces in the x direction. As we move in the x direction, the pressure reduces. So our pressure gradient, dp dx, is negative. The pressure reduces, and the pressure is what drives the flow along the channel against the action of friction from the wall. So we have this negative pressure gradient, and the minus sign ensures that the axial velocity component is positive. That's why we have the minus sign there. And we have the dynamic viscosity, of course, because that um, enters the equations because it provides the resistance from the walls of the channel to the flow moving along. And then we have yh minus y squared. So the y squared, of course, because the profile is quadratic, and it's going to reach a maximum at the center line of the channel that we see there. So this is our equation. And what does it really tell us? What does this equation tell us? Well, it tells us that actually the strength of the axial velocity component depends on the pressure gradient. And this is a key idea that we're going to be using in the course. So let's say that this is the shape of the axial velocity profile when the pressure gradient dp dx is equal to, let's say, minus two pascals per meter. That's the shape of our velocity profile. But if we were to solve this problem and actually the pressure gradient is stronger than that, let's say we have a really strong pressure gradient and actually the pressure gradient is minus six pascals per meter, that would mean that the shape of this velocity profile is still quadratic, but actually, in this case, the velocity profile may look something more like this. It's still quadratic in shape. We still have that yh minus y squared in there, u as a function of y, but the shape of the velocity profile depends on the pressure gradient. This is the key idea for us to actually understand the simple algorithm and how it works. So for this flow in parallel sided channel, we've understood the idea that different pressure gradients result in different velocity profiles. So our pressure gradient may look fairly shallow like this, if we have a small pressure gradient, say minus two. If we have a stronger pressure gradient, then our velocity profile may look something like this. That's the key idea that we're going to be using here. And how can we apply this idea to understand how to solve the continuity and the Navier-Stokes equations numerically? Well, if we take this simple example problem, we're only in 2D, we're looking at an incompressible, steady laminar flow with constant material properties. The U momentum equation in the Navier-Stokes equations looks something like this. Partial over partial X, rho U U plus partial over partial Y, rho U V is equal to minus DP DX plus partial over partial x, 
mu du by dx plus partial over partial y mu du by dy. So this is our equation. This is our u momentum equation. And we don't know how to solve this yet, but that's okay. For this lecture, all I want you to do is imagine that we could solve this equation. We had some kind of numerical method, like the finite volume method, which could solve this equation for us. And what the equation would do is it would tell us that, depending on the pressure gradient, we would actually get a different velocity field, u. And that's the idea we just looked at with the flow in the parallel sided channel. And so what we're going to do is actually use the pressure gradient as an input. We're going to use the pressure gradient as an input. dp dx, that's the idea. We take dp dx as our input. We choose our dp dx, maybe it's minus two pascals per meter, maybe it's minus six. We apply this as a source term in the equation and then we have some kind of numerical method that will solve our equation and it will produce a u velocity field. And if this were the flow in the parallel sided channel that we just saw before, then of course the solution would actually be mu is minus one over two mu dp dx y h minus y squared. It would look something like that if we had our flow in a parallel sided channel, but for a more general flow, it would look something different, but we would have our u velocity component as our solution. This is the central idea of the simple algorithm. We choose a pressure gradient, dp dx, as an input. We use a numerical method to solve the u component of the Navier-Stokes equations, and we get a u velocity field out of the equation. Now, there are many questions that are still to answer with this. How do we choose what our input is? How do we know if our output is correct? And how do we solve this equation? All of these questions are going to be answered in this course. But what I want you to think about now, of course, is that there are actually three components of the Navier-Stokes equations. We also have the V momentum equation. And we also have the W momentum equation. And we can do exactly the same idea that we've used for the U momentum equation for those as well. But of course, the difference will be is that for the V momentum equation, the pressure gradient here is dp dy. And of course, for these fields as well, the independent variable is the V component of the velocity field. And the solution here is the V component of the velocity field. So we can use exactly the same idea for V and W. We choose a pressure gradient, dp dy. We solve the V component of the momentum equation and we calculate the V component of the velocity field. And we do the same for the W component of the velocity field. So we have this with this approach. We're just choosing a pressure gradient and we're solving and we're calculating this velocity field. Of course, the next stage is that these three pressure gradients, dp dx, dp dy, and dp dz, need to be consistent. So actually, all we can do is just add a small stage to the start of this algorithm to make sure that those pressure gradients are consistent. If we start with a guess for the actual pressure field, p, we use this as our input, then what we do is we can differentiate this to get dp dx, dp dy, and dp dz. And of course, we don't know at this stage how we might do this differentiation numerically, but just know that we could choose an appropriate numerical method to do it. We start with our input pressure field, we differentiate, to get the components dp dx, dp dy, dp dz, and they will of course be consistent because they've been calculated from the same pressure field. And then we can solve those u, v, and w momentum equations to calculate u, v, and w. This is the central idea 
of the simple algorithm and how it works. Starting with the pressure field, differentiate, solve using finite volume method, finite element method or finite difference method, and then we have an output which are the three components of the velocity field. But how do we know if this is correct? How do we know if our input is correct? And how do we know if our output is correct? The key here is to notice that we've used the three momentum equations, but we haven't used the continuity equation. And we can use the continuity equation as a check on the outputs that we've just calculated. So as a reminder, what does the continuity equation look like? If we write the continuity equation in terms of its three components, we have du by dx plus dv by dy plus dw by dz is equal to zero. That's our continuity equation. And we've just calculated u, v, and w for a given input pressure field. So what we can actually do is we can define a function. We can define some function f and say that this function is equal to du by dx plus dv by dy plus dw by dz. This is a scalar function. We can calculate the derivatives du by dx plus dv by dy plus dv by dz and evaluate this function. And what's that going to tell us? Well, the key is What's the value of the function? If f is equal to zero, that means that the continuity equation is satisfied and we have the correct solution. We have a correct output velocity vector field, u, v, and w, that satisfies the u, v, and w momentum equations and also the continuity equation. So if f equals zero, the algorithm has converged. But if f is not equal to zero, that means that these u, v, and w components of the velocity field satisfy the Navier-Stokes equations because we solved them to calculate u, v, and w, but they don't satisfy the continuity equation. So this is the incorrect velocity field. And the velocity field was generated by our input pressure field. So that means that we have to make a new choice for that pressure field. Our input guess was wrong. We have to go back to the start of the algorithm, all the way up to the top, and choose a new guess for the pressure field. And what we can do then, this gives us our overall process. We can choose our pressure field, go through the algorithm, evaluate F, and keep looping until we have our solution. That is the overall approach for the simple algorithm. We can write that concisely in a single diagram and I've got a more detailed, cleaner version of the diagram for you in the lecture notes, which you can look at. But just for us, how does this actually work? Let's do a recap. We start with our input for the pressure field, P. We calculate dp dx, dp dy, dp dz. We solve the u, v, and w components of the momentum equations. That will allow us to calculate u, v, and w. We then calculate that function f. And if f is equal to zero, then our algorithm has converged. But if f is not equal to zero, then we know that this input pressure field that generated this velocity field was the incorrect choice. So we have to go back round and start again. And this is the basis of the simple loop that's used in the simple algorithm. Now, of course, I haven't gone into much detail here for the equations, actually how they're solved, but this is the principle and this is the conceptual idea that we can use to solve the continuity in Navier-Stokes equations with the simple algorithm. Now, what I'm going to do in the next lecture is go through the choice for this pressure field because the algorithm is not yet complete. How do we choose the next input pressure field? How do we make sure that that pressure field is better than the one we currently have? Are we going to choose at random or is there a method that we can use 
to ensure that our pressure field gets consecutively better as we go through the algorithm. That's what I'm going to be going through in the next lecture. So that wraps up the sneak preview for lecture two from my course on the simple algorithm. If you want to get the rest of the course, I've left a link in the description below the video. So just follow the link and you can get access to the remainder of the course and the rest of the lectures, which follow a really simple format to the format you've seen today. The other thing I've done as well is I've left uh, an early bird discount to the course. So if you sign up within the first month, you'll get a discount. And also, as well as that early bird discount, I've also thrown in free access to my Inkscape course, where you can learn how I produce all of my diagrams and figures for the course, the course textbook, and also for all of the lectures that you see here on YouTube. So if you sign up in the first month, you'll get access to that absolutely free. Anyway, I really hope you've enjoyed this new style of teaching, and I hope to see you in my new course on the Simple Algorithm.